Good morning. <laughs> but you're surprised to see me up here, aren't you? Hey, listen, we're going to start our service off with a couple of songs by the bells, so I want you to sit still, listen, but worship with them this morning. Amanda?
appreciate you all so much. We have returned from Georgia this past week. Some of us have been down in a small place called Social Circle, Georgia. I did see a lot of this color that's on your seats there. I'm thinking about maybe we need to change that. I, I, I really missed the orange down there this week, and I made a commitment <clears throat> to get like an orange hoodie on our next mission trip down to Alabama. I'm going to represent orange because I just I appreciated it uh, more when I got back into Tennessee. So I was blessed by the different churches that gathered with us in Social Circle. We had at least five different states represented. Um, blessed by the Spirit of the Lord that is at work all around us. Many, many churches doing awesome things for the Lord. We walk into there and instantly the Spirit of God just unites us all together. So that's, that's a blessing. All around the world we see that. Uh, the Holy Spirit bringing us together. And that's why we're here today, and we welcome you, in the name of the Lord, to, to gather together with us. So glad that you're here. I'm Chad. I'm the missions pastor here. Uh, we want to glorify the Lord today, and what else do we want to do? We want to enjoy Jesus. I love that saying. We are here to glorify and enjoy Jesus today. I pray that that, that is why you're here. If you're a guest, I want to say welcome. There is a blue card. Uh, in, the, in the seat in front of you. Please fill that out. Let us know who you are. There's a place for prayer requests there. Today we have a 4 p.m. outreach. How many of y'all know about that? We are leaving the doors of this church. We are going to the neighborhood right behind the church. We're going to a neighborhood uh, across from uh, Apple Apple Creek. Yeah, we're going to walk, walk all through there. Love to have you with us. All we're doing is inviting people to church, giving them a Easter card. I uh, pray that you would consider being with us today. If you're a little scared of that, good. I am too. And that's where faith comes in. Amen? We put one foot in front of the other, and if we get to pray with one family today and encourage them in their faith, today will be worthwhile. So today at 4 o'clock, we're going to go out and invite our community to come in. This Wednesday also, we have our BG Kids Easter event at 6. That is in your bulletin. Please look at that. Super big event, super important. This coming Friday at 6 p.m. Are we in here or are we up there? Up in the old sanctuary, we will have our uh, Friday night, Good Friday service. We we'll look forward to that this coming Friday. Uh, please take this card, y'all. This is the most important thing I want to share with you. Give this away to one person this week. Let the Lord lead you to that person and just say, hey, we'd love to have you at, at church on Sunday. Come join us as, as we celebrate Easter together. I'm excited to be here today. I want to ask you to stand. Let's have a word of prayer. Uh, thank you for your grace and patience with the announcements. They're all so important, but not as important as calling upon the name of the Lord. Thank you to our bells for leading us in worship this morning. Father, I do want to say thank you for Social Circle Georgia, for Rockdale Baptist, and those believers down there, Lord, that are broadening their influence in the community. I pray, Father, your richest blessing upon them as they reach their community. I pray, pray the same for us, Father, that Louisville, Tennessee would know that Beach Grove is here for you. We are here for your glory. We are here for your word. We are here for salvation. We are here for discipleship, Lord. We are here for evangelism. But, Father, we are unable to do all these things apart from your blessing. So touch us, Lord, with Holy Spirit power today. Fill us, Lord fresh and new, with just your word, your encouragement, all the things good and perfect that you would bring into this congregation today, and Father, those around us as well. We need your blessing and your help as we worship you today. We want to do that well. I pray for Matt, Father, as he preaches, your power, your authority, your wisdom, your courage, your conviction. Father, as we go out today at 4 o'clock, Father, would you do miracles through your people going out? Father, just knocking on doors, finding people that are discouraged that we can pray with. I pray that all that would happen today. Father, we love you so much. We are so honored to be this body of Christ in this town. Father, bless us, Father, that folks could just see the glory of heaven and feel the power of God when they walk in this place. 
Father, apart from you, we can do nothing. We are totally dependent upon your touch today. Father, I do pray for repentance in our lives. Father, that we could be bold and holy. And Father, we would not have evil reigning and ruling over us in our own personal lives. Father, we want to repent this morning of things that we have said and done that are just just evil. Father, and they're in our, it's in our hearts. We want to repent of that today. Father, we call upon heaven to shine forth and bless our music today. Bless Steve as he leads, Kyle as he's away. But most of all, Lord, that your word would be taught and that our hearts would be encouraged and we walk out of here, Father, with our faith renewed in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. You may be seated for about two minutes. I have to get my large print here so I can see. I tell you, yes, thank you. You want to hold it out there for me? I am a... Uh, I'm excited. I am pumped to be up here again. It's, it's a rare thing I get to do this, but I am, I am so thankful that Kyle graciously asked me to lead this morning. I uh, love being up here and uh, always have, always will. You know, this is Palm Sunday, and a lot of people don't realize or know what Palm Sunday is, so let me just tell you real quickly. This was the week before Easter or before the crucifixion when Jesus rode into Jerusalem and the people, they went crazy. Here's our king. Our king is finally here to free us. And they shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were, they were, they were more pumped up than watching the UT game last night or yesterday afternoon. And we need to be that way too. Michelle and I had to go to a funeral last night, and it was at a small church. And I'm telling you, those people like to took the the roof off when they were singing their songs and I pray that you will do the same thing today we're going to sing some exciting songs and and I just want you to let it out you know God said make a joyful noise unto the Lord he knew that he didn't give the gift of singing to everybody he gives different gifts to each person but he expects everybody to sing to him so I want you uh after I read the scripture I want you to stand and sing with us so I'm going to start out reading uh, Psalm 111, and this is just, uh, Matt asked me to read the scripture, and it just couldn't be any better for today, so thank you, Matt. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart, in the company of the upright, in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the inheritance of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Stand, if you will, and let's sing to God be the glory.
can have a seat as we're going to read Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lift up his voice and address them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since, since it is only the third hour of the day, but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declared, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, that your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood, Before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the path of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne... He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ. That he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens. But he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstools. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness 
of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourself from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Wow. Amen. Yeah, praise the Lord for it. Uh, I, want to, I want to go into a moment of guided prayer. Where I'm going to just lead you guys and want to pray for. So if we can all just take a moment to bow our heads and close our eyes. Take a moment to praise God for his attributes and his actions. Take a moment to confess your sins before God this morning. Now count your blessings and thank God for them. Finally, cast your cares, whatever they may be, upon Jesus. Oh God of heaven, we love you. We want to continue worshiping you because that's what you deserve. Help us, Holy Spirit, even now, love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. In your name, Jesus. Amen. If you'll stand, we'll continue to sing.
see a victory for the battle belongs to you lord i'm gonna see a victory i'm gonna see a victory praise you this morning. Amen. You may be seated. Um, would you all uh, recite with me our memory verse here? I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body, we have many members, and in the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Um, let's pray. Our Father and our God, um, we just thank you today um, for the Lord Jesus, God, uh, who so many years ago rode into the city of Jerusalem humbly on a donkey, and Lord, that city would reject you and cast you out and crucify you, Lord. Um, so let us not be like Jerusalem today, Lord. Um, would you cause in our hearts just such a love for you and what you've done for us, God. Um, God, help us to not reject you, but instead see you as the cornerstone. Um, God, you are the one who built this church. Um, and God, we do everything for you. And that includes our giving and our offering to you, Father. So I pray in this time. God, would you just give us hearts of joy, um, cheerful, that we may have the privilege to give to you, God, and give back to what you've given to us, Lord. Um, I just thank you, Lord. I just pray as, as we go into this time where we go into your word and we hear from you, Lord, help our hearts to be attentive. God, it's so difficult sometimes for us to focus. But Father, I just pray that you'd supernaturally overcome our thoughts so that we may learn more about you and become more like you, Lord. In your name I pray, amen. Um, ushers, if you come forward. You can take your Bibles and turn to Mark chapter 12. So we're going to be looking at verses 35 through 37. Today is Palm Sunday. Um, if 
I was a smarter man, we'd be preaching Mark chapter 11, 1 through 11 today. Um, but I can't time it out that well, so we're in Mark chapter 12, verses 35 through 37. Uh, but I will say these are kind of, at, at the very least, parallel themes is what I'll, what I'll say. In, in, in Palm Sunday, we, we see, if you remember that sermon, almost a false coronation of Jesus Christ, where he was getting praised, but not in the way that he really should. Today, in the text, we see Jesus get seated upon the throne that he truly deserves. Let's read the text. Mark 13, uh, it's 12, 35 through 37. This is God's word for us this morning. And as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, How can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself and the Holy Spirit declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord, so how is he his son? And the great throng heard him gladly. It's God's word for us this morning. Let's go to God now and ask for his blessing upon it. Holy Spirit, we believe that you wrote these words. Stunning to think about. As we come to your word, God, I pray that we can be reverent. God, I pray that we can have a right understanding of it. Not only of its contents, God, but help us understand the nature of it that you have spoken. And that when we come to this, these three verses, God, it's you speaking to us, you revealing the truth to us, you, you showing your glory to us. And so God, Holy Spirit, even in this moment, will you illuminate this passage to help us understand it rightly? Will you guard us from error? God, will you guard us from boredom? God, help us repent of being bored, help from help us being distracted, for, uh, prevent us from being worldly-minded. God, and thinking about the things of this world. God, and help us be so attuned to your word this morning. God, help us love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Help us love your word. God, open our eyes so that we can behold wondrous things out of your law. God, you have the words of eternal life. To whom else shall we go? God, we need this. God, help our hearts and our minds and our attitudes reflect the glorious nature of your word. And then, God, help, help us apply it to our lives and help it transform the way we live and think and move and, and do life. God, we just need your help. In your name, Jesus, amen. I remember my very first church interview I was 18 years old, and I sat down with the personnel team of First Baptist Alcoa, and I was extremely nervous. I mean, this was a dream for me to even be interviewing for a position. It was about 12 hours a week or something like that, leading music for the student ministry, but I was really nervous, and you know how those personnel teams can be. They can be intimidating and scary and uh, and so I was up in front, and I just wanted to do a really good job. I wanted to be impressive. I wanted to seem like I had my act together. Um, so I sit down, wanted to do a great job. And the very first question posed to me was, if God told Noah to bring two of every kind of animal on the ark and seven pairs of clean animals, why did God decide to have eight people on the ark? I was absolutely stumped. I, I might have been stumped with our um, search team. I don't remember. I don't know if it was this bad, though. I stammered, stammered, stumbled over my words, trying to come up with some deep and impressive answer on the spot about the importance of community or something like that. I don't really, really remember. And after I squirmed in my seat for a couple minutes, the whole team laughed, and they got to their real questions. And that question had me stumped. And today we are going to see Jesus ask a question that's going to stump everyone around him, specifically the Sanhedrin. So what we're going to do today, here's our game plan. We're going to walk through the passage. That'll happen fairly quickly. And then we're going to look at six doctrines that we find in this passage. Okay, so we're going to walk through it and then see six doctrines that we see. So by this point, um, in the context of the book of Mark, Jesus has been asked three consecutive questions. 
one from the Pharisees, starting in verse 13, one from the Sadducees, starting in verse 18, and then one from a single scribe, starting in verse 28. And we see, and we've seen in the past three weeks, Jesus win each debate. He comes away as the champion. And so we see in verse 34, we really didn't talk about this ending of the verse last week. It says, and after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Obviously, this scheme of trying to trap Jesus in his talk that we see in verse 13, see that? They're trying to trap him in his talk. Obviously, this game plan is not going to work. So they're ready to quit. The only problem is, Jesus wants to keep playing. And so Jesus says, okay, now it's my turn. Let me ask a question. And that's what we see in today's passage. The question that Jesus asks is a biblical and theological question about the identity of the Messiah. The scribes believed that the Messiah or the Christ, those terms are interchangeable, was to be a man from the line of David who would politically rule like David and reestablish the glory of the earthly kingdom of Israel. And so Jesus asks a question specifically about Psalm 110, verse 1, which everyone in the conversation would agree is a psalm about the future Messiah. A little background on Psalm 110. Psalm 110 was originally a hymn that would be sung at the inauguration of the kings of Judah and Israel. The first Lord in the Hebrew is Yahweh, and the second Lord in the Hebrew is Adonai. So the first one is, you know, the the personal name of God. The second one is this more generic Lord or, or Adonai. And historically, in the song, The first Lord, Yahweh, referred to God, and the second one referred to the king, who would, in his inauguration and beginning to be the king, would represent God and wield the authority of God in his kingship. But once the monarchy was destroyed, and there was no more kings around, Psalm 110 began to be seen as a messianic psalm. What do I mean by that? The the Davidic monarchy had failed, and obviously the promises of Psalm 110 had yet to come true. And so, the logic went, it must be, therefore, about somebody else to come in the future. So, the interpretation began to be that the first Lord is still Yahweh, but the second Lord, this Adonai, represented the Messiah to come, the Christ, the anointed one. That's what the scribes believed about Psalm 110. And from the question we see, that's what Jesus believed about Psalm 110 as well. So we can safely assume that's the correct interpretation of Psalm 110. Now, we're just looking at that first verse of this psalm, which, by the way, is the most quoted Old Testament verse in all the New Testament. Psalm 110, verse 1, is quoted in the New Testament more than any other Old Testament verse. We're not talking about the whole psalm today. It's worth your time to study it. But David refers to the future Messiah as Adonai, or Lord. And Jesus then makes the argument that if the future Messiah was simply the son of David, why does David call the future Messiah Lord? Does that make sense? Because that would imply the son is superior to the father. This would be like Andy calling Opie Paw. You see, it's it's reversed. It doesn't make sense. So that's what Jesus is getting at in verse 37, where he says, David calls him Lord, so how is he his son? And through this question, Jesus is asserting and showing that the scribes had not accounted for all the data informing their biblical theology of the Messiah. He's basically saying, hey, all, everything you're saying sounds good, but you missed this verse. How does, how does Psalm 110.1 fit into all this? In response to this, the great throng heard him gladly. There's this huge group of people in the temple. 
that have been in the audience watching this showdown between Jesus and the Sanhedrin, and they've clearly seen Jesus win battle after battle after battle. The theological giants of the day aren't able to defeat a carpenter from Nazareth in theological debate. The crowd is once again blown away by the wisdom and authority of Jesus Christ. Although later in the week, as we know, they will change their mind. Okay, so that's the, that's the passage. Um, we're not done, though. Six doctrines, um, I think, are clearly seen in this passage that I want us to learn today. Number one is the biblical belief of Christ. The biblical belief in Christ. Christ's view of the Scriptures. I think we see this, and it's really important for us. Notice that, yet again, Jesus appeals to the authority of Scripture when he's in these debates. In the question about politics, he appeals to, implicitly appeals to the principle found in Genesis 127. In the principle about um, the resurrection and, and in this argument about theology, he appeals to Exodus 3, verse 6. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. In his argument about, or the, the question about the law and what's the most important commandment, he goes to Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. He goes to Leviticus 19, 18. And now... He appeals to Psalm 110.1. It's very clear from this whole large section of Mark chapter 12 that Jesus Christ believes in the authority of the Scriptures. Do you see that? He, in, in any question, he goes, well, the Bible says this. Well, the Bible says that. That's how he argues. That's how he debates. It didn't matter what the scribe said. It mattered what the Scripture said. And if Psalm 110 verse 1 contradicted the scribes' theology, the scribes needed to change their theology. Jesus would agree with our statement of faith. And that's a good thing, isn't it? It's always nice when Jesus agrees with our statement of faith. The Baz Faith the Message Article 1 says, All Scripture is totally true and trustworthy. It reveals the principles by which God judges us and therefore is and will remain to the end of the world the true center of Christian union and the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and religious opinions should be tried. In other words, it doesn't matter what someone on YouTube said. It doesn't matter what your pastor may have said. It doesn't matter what your opinion may be. The Scripture is our standard. That's how Jesus argued. He said, let's look at the Bible. Also notice that Jesus affirms that David wrote Psalm 110. See that? David himself. That's what it says in verse 36. Now, a lot of modern scholarship disagrees with the Davidic authorship of Psalm 110. But I'm going to side with Jesus over modern scholarship. Notice he says in verse 36, David himself, and then quotes Psalm 10. That's enough for me. Okay, but he doesn't just say that. Notice what he says, David himself in the Holy Spirit declared, and then quotes Psalm 110.1. Jesus believes that Psalm 110 verse 1 is not just the opinion and word of David. Jesus believes that Psalm 110 is also the opinion and word of the Holy Spirit. Who is God, by the way. So here we see Jesus affirming the dual authorship of Psalm 110 and that's just that's one example of the whole Old Testament. In other words, David wrote it, but the Holy Spirit wrote it too. So Psalm 110 verse 1 is David's word, but it's also God's word. Here we see the doctrine of the inspiration of the scriptures, which means that every word found in the Bible finds its ultimate source from God the Holy Spirit. Now, this is a quote from my, one of my seminary professors, Rob Plummer, who says, this is amazing, while the authors of the Bible wrote as thinking, feeling human beings, God so mysteriously superintended the process that every word written was also the exact word he wanted to be written, free from all error. So notice the doctrine of inspiration does not imply that David was a robot. That's not what we believe about inspiration, that, you know, 
Paul wrote down and like was in a trance and was like, I just wrote the book of Romans. That's not what we think happened, right? Or, or the book of Mark. No. David wrote exactly what he wanted to write. He, he sat down to write Psalm 110. But God mysteriously superintended the process that every word written was exactly every word that God wanted to be written. That's how Jesus saw the Bible. Apparently that's what Jesus taught Peter. As Peter teaches in 2 Peter 1.21, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But listen, here's this doctrine of inspiration. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So one way to think about it, the Bible is 100% man and 100% God. Isn't that incredible? Okay, number two, the biblical prophecies of Christ. We can often assume that all the Jesus stuff is in the New Testament, right? If you want to read about Jesus, you need to open it up to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the Old Testament, we can often and wrongly think, is just full of boring genealogies and outdated laws. But that could not be further from the truth. The Old Testament is saturated with good news about Jesus Christ. In our passage today, in this one verse, we see that David wrote about Christ and predicted what would happen with Christ. And the Psalms specifically are so full of references to Jesus Christ that some say in the Psalms you should look for Christ just as much as you look for David. The Old Testament is not a dead irrelevant, embarrassing book. Actually, the Old Testament is all about Jesus. At least that's what Jesus thinks. John 5, 39, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they who bear witness about me. Jesus, after his resurrection on the road to Emmaus, Luke 24, 27, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Later on with the disciples, Luke 24, 44. These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Is that not incredible? The Old Testament is not a relevant book for us. The Old Testament is not just boring history. But Jesus argues the Old Testament is about me. Therefore, we can't, can't, can't unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. But we must read our Old Testament carefully and reverently and in full expectation that we will find Christ in its pages. Okay, let's talk about the earthly lineage of Christ. This is doctrine number three. The assumed background to Jesus' question is that the scribes believed that the Messiah was supposed to be of the lineage of David. Now, what I want to point out to you is that this expectation is completely biblical. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 11 through 16. From the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the son of men, but my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever." This is God speaking to David on the day that David became king. And God promised David that from his lineage there would be born a son who will sit on the throne forever. As you read it, you can tell this was not perfectly fulfilled by Solomon or any of the other kings. So as every king faded away, anticipation grew that there would come someone from the line of David who would reign forever. This is exactly what blind Bartimaeus was anticipating in Mark 10, 47. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He called him son of David. That's why the crowds on Palm Sunday were shouting in Mark 11, verse 10, 
Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. So the scribes are not wrong about Jesus being the son of David. They're not wrong about that. That's exactly the, the point Matthew shows in his very first verse of his gospel, Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Paul uses this language to talk about Jesus' identity. 2 Timothy 2.8, remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead, the offspring of David. Romans 1.3, concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh. You see that? The Bible is very clear. Jesus is the son of David. Jesus comes from the lineage of David. So the question has to be, what's the deal with this question? It almost seems like, in context, that Jesus is denying that he is the son of David. Like he is claiming that based on Psalm 110, he couldn't possibly be the son of David. So is that what Jesus is claiming? That the Bible is wrong and that it contradicts itself? It will come to a great surprise to you all that I do not think that is the case. And that's good, right? For job security? Yeah. Please fire me if I say otherwise. The scribes were wrong because they believed the Messiah to merely be the son of David. When in fact the scriptures indicated that he would be so much more. Doctrine number four, the eternal deity of Christ Jesus is not just David's son. No, Jesus is David's Lord. That's what David calls Jesus in Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord, Yahweh, said to my Lord, my Adonai. Now, it is very unusual, as we all know, for a father to call his son Lord. But this is an, a, a very, very, very unusual situation because in the case of David and Jesus, the son is older than the father. You don't see that every day, right? The son is older than the father. Yes, David was on earth about a thousand years before. Jesus is saying this in Mark chapter 12. But you know, Abraham, who comes on the scene in Genesis 12, was on earth about a thousand years before David. And Jesus says in John 8, 58, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So the Son of God, who took on human flesh in Matthew chapter 1, let's just say, existed before 2 Samuel 7 ever happened. Existed before Genesis 12 ever happened. Actually, the Bible teaches that the Son of God existed even before Genesis 1, 1 happened. Yes, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And Jesus pre-existed the act of creation. How do we know that? Scripture. John 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. So it's true. But incomplete. To only say that Jesus is the son of David. That's like if somebody asks you, what do you do every Sunday there at Beech Grove? And you said, oh, we get together and sing some songs. Okay, that is true, but not the whole picture, right? That's what Jesus is getting at with these questions. How can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? Verse 37, David calls himself the Lord, so how is he his son? No one was able to answer him on that day. But since we have the whole counsel of God revealed to us in the Scriptures, revealed to us in the Old and New Testaments, we can see what Jesus' point is. Jesus is simultaneously David's son and David's Lord. Jesus truly is the son of David. But Jesus is also the son of God. In other words, Jesus is not a normal man. Jesus is not a super special man. Jesus Christ is the God-man. This is the doctrine of the hypostatic union, which means that the eternal God, fully God, permanently took to himself a human nature in such a way that keeps both natures fully intact. 
but fully united. So that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has two natures and one person. So He is 100% God while simultaneously being 100% man. The Son of David and the Son of God. So Jesus is David's son according to his humanity, but Jesus is David's Lord according to his divinity. And what else is there to do in response to this but to worship? Is Jesus not amazing? God the Son in human flesh. David's son, simultaneously David's Lord. A human being like me and you. Simultaneously being the creator of all the universe. Doctrine number five is the current session of Christ. Psalm 110, verse 1, as we've already said, is a messianic prophecy. But here's the question. What is the prophecy predicting? The prophecy predicts that at some point in time, God the Father will tell God the Son to sit at his right hand, which is symbolic for a position of power and Authority. So the question I want to ask now is, has this messianic prophecy already been fulfilled or is it something that will happen in the future? The Bible teaches after the resurrection, Jesus physically ascended into heaven, Acts 1-9. When he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And where did he go? Peter makes it clear in his Pentecost sermon that we read earlier. Acts 2, 29, Brothers, I, I, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, which makes sense because David was speaking in the Holy Spirit and predicting about Christ, so David is referred to as a prophet here by Peter. And knowing that God had sworn an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, right there, 2 Samuel 7, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. That's the, you know, the, the Spirit's work at Pentecost. For David did not ascend into the heavens. But he himself says, quoting Psalm 110, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. Hebrews 1.3, He, being Christ, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the word of His power. And, I mean, that person in human flesh, is that not amazing? But it goes on to say, After making purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So the first part of this prophecy, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, has happened. It's been fulfilled in the past. It's playing out in the present. Jesus Christ, David's son and David's Lord, has taken his seat at the right hand of God. And this is called by theologians the session of Christ, which is just a kind of majestic way to say sitting. What does this mean, though? Don't think that Jesus is relaxing up in heaven. Like, okay, he's done his work, now he's seated. No. He's very active. The session of Christ means that Jesus Christ in his human body has been inaugurated publicly as the king. Not merely of Israel, but over the entire universe. And so what this means, the session of Christ, this Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, means that the resurrected Jesus Christ, David's son and David's Lord, is ruling and reigning over the cosmos. Peter describes Jesus in 1 Peter 3.22 as the one who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers having been subjected to him. Past tense, they've been subjected. Ephesians 1, 20 through 22, Paul says the same thing. Peter and Paul on the same page. That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, 
not only in this age, which means it's true in this age. Do you see that? Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God right now, far above all rule, all authority, all power, all dominion, every name, every angel, every being, not only in this age, but in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church. So Jesus Christ is the Lord. He's ruling and reigning in heaven, right hand of God, right now. Over what? Over you. Jesus Christ is the Lord over your individual life, and you owe Him your absolute obedience. Not only that, Jesus Christ is the King over the church. And particularly, Jesus Christ is the King over this church. Therefore, He gets the final decision on how we do things. Not only that, but Jesus Christ is the Lord and King over every single human being who's ever existed even though his lordship may go temporarily unrecognized, everyone is commanded to repent, believe, and surrender to King Jesus. Not only that, Jesus Christ is the King and Lord over all the hosts of heaven, all the angel armies, legions of angels are at his sovereign command. Not only that, Jesus Christ is the Lord over every single molecule of the universe. He is in control of the farthest stars, and has full authority over every single corner of the galaxy. Every single galaxy. Not only that, but Jesus Christ is the Lord of history and Lord of the future. He's sitting on the throne. He's the one in charge. He's the sovereign King of kings and Lord of lords. Hebrews 2.8 sums it up well. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he has left nothing outside his control. I want to ask, do you believe that? Oh, what an anchor for the soul to know the doctrine of the session of Christ. That Jesus Christ is in control of this world. You need this doctrine when you're scrolling through the news. Jesus Christ is on the throne. He is the King. Now, Hebrews 2.8 goes on to say, is it all there on the screen? Yeah. A fairly honest um, admission here. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to Him. Now that's true when you're scrolling through the news, right? I'm saying Jesus Christ is in control. He's on the throne. He's ruling and reigning the universe. And you might be thinking, as you sit here, it doesn't exactly feel like that. Right? That's what Hebrews is saying right here in verse 2 eight. It's an honest statement and a true one doesn't always feel like we have a perfectly righteous king ruling and reigning over the universe. But let's believe the Bible over our experience. The scripture is our authority, and the scripture says it's true. And listen, one day, even though at present we don't see everything in subjection to him, one day Christ's ruling and reigning position of authority is going to be so undeniably true that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, which leads us to our last doctrine, the future conquering of Christ. Notice again in Jesus' quoting of Psalm 110 that the prophecy doesn't end with the Messiah seated at the right hand of God, but the prophecy ends with the Messiah sitting at Yahweh's right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. So in the immediate context, Psalm 110 would be sounding the alarm for the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes. The Sanhedrin has decided to destroy Christ. They've chosen to become Jesus Christ's enemies. And Jesus is quoting this prophecy at them to warn them, my enemies are going to be destroyed. But I pray this won't just be an alarm for them, but it'll be an alarm for us as well, for those who might be an enemy of Christ in this room. Because Psalm 110.1 has a future fulfillment that is yet to come to fruition. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 15, 23, but each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, and is coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Yes, Jesus Christ is the current ruling and reigning, resurrected king, seated in power at the right hand of God. And at his command, all human history is coming to a conclusion where he is going to physically return to this planet to make all things right. 
He is going to finally and decisively defeat the devil and the dominion of darkness. And he is going to finally judge the living and the dead and justly punish all evildoers. And the last thing the Bible says he's going to destroy is death itself. Jesus Christ is going to put death to death. And we already know he can do that because he's already been victorious over death itself. That's why Paul says later in verse 54, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Easter has come early at Beach Grove. Christian, be encouraged by the promises of Scripture. Jesus Christ has lived, died, risen, ascended, is currently seated at the right hand of God, and is coming back again. We have that promise. We have the promise of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Listen to this. And so, we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Let's be like the great throng of people in verse 37. And hear this gladly. Because it is good news. Glad tidings. Great joy. Jesus Christ is David's son. Jesus Christ is David's Lord. And if he is our Lord, we will be with him forever and always. But if he's not your Lord, if you're an enemy of Christ this morning, be warned by this prophecy that you will be placed under Christ's feet, that you will be destroyed. Heed the warning as it says in Psalm 2 as we close, verses 10 through 12. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, we worship you for your identity as David's son and David's Lord. God, I pray that these truths of Scripture will sink into our hearts and change the way we view things. God, I pray if there's anybody here who doesn't know you, who's currently an enemy of you, God, I pray that they'll take refuge in your name. That they'll surrender to you now, repenting and placing their faith in you. God, I pray this church can just love you, Jesus. Help us love you. What a beautiful picture of who you are. I pray that we can just further grasp your depths. Open our eyes so that we can behold wondrous things out of your law. And God, help us respond in the spirit of spirit and truth now. In your name, Jesus. Amen. We have somebody back here If you need to talk to anybody, Pastor Chad's right here. So if you just slip out during this last song, if you have any questions or want to pray or anything, will you stand and respond in song with us? Yeah.
thank Steve for leading today. Wasn't that wonderful? Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Real quickly, um, Chad wanted me to mention, I think he might have forgotten, right, uh, the security team meeting. This is for prospective security. If you're in security, please go to the refuge right now, basically, right for the service. That will be wonderful. The annex, not the refuge. The refuge. The refuge. So right there in the refuge. Um, Chelsea won't be there, so it's okay. Um, <laughs> Hey, if I can encourage you one more time, take one of these cards with you. Personally invite somebody to um, our services on Sunday. It's an extremely powerful invitation for you to just extend to a neighbor, a family member, friend, something. So I want to challenge everybody to grab one. We, we put one on every seat. Grab a couple more. We'd love for you to take one of these. And also we're going to be passing these out at 4 o'clock on Sunday. And we need bodies. Okay, we're going to be, yeah, 4 o'clock today. What would I say? It is Sunday. 4 o'clock on Sunday. <laughs> You, here, come up here. You want to? Okay. <laughs> Chelsea's going to do the announcements next time. Uh, four o'clock today, we're going to be passing these out. Um, and you want to be a church on mission. Hearts broken for those far from Christ. Here's an awesome opportunity for us to reach our neighborhood. Um, we're going to respond with the doxology. You got it in me? You got it? Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Let's sing together. 